All right, welcome back to another episode of Shifting Schools and Trisha and I are excited to announce uh, our first episode in our mini series running all summer long here over at Shifting Schools, all about esports. And Trisha, I'm really excited because we're actually uh, creating this introduction where we've done most of the interviews already. And so you and I have already been kind of in this, really? This is esports. This is what's going on. These are all the things. Uh, I think both of us, we kind of went into this wanting to put together this esports series because we both knew that we needed to learn more around esports. Uh, and we're calling it a mini series, even though it looks like right now it's nine episodes. It's a pretty good series amongst itself. Um, but I think today's episode where we get started with Dr. Malone really starts to tap into what you're going to be hearing throughout all of these uh, episodes coming up. What are, what are some of the through lines for you, Trisha, that you are kind of, as, as we get ready to launch this, what are some of the through lines for you that you think listeners are really going to hear come back up again and again and again? I think number one, and, and I think this is in part why this, the mini series grew and grew. We just wanted to have more conversations. Number one for me is the limitless connections and bridges. Mm. Um, you know, I've been telling a few friends that you and I have been working on this series and they kind of like raise their eyebrows and why, and you know, the, the research that you and I have done in learning about how huge the industry of gaming is. Yeah. Um, it is bigger than the entire movie industry. It is bigger than the entire music industry. And so in terms of helping students understand potential future pathways. I think this mini series does a great job of showing my goodness, like you may think that, you know, the connections, but I yeah. promise you there are more than you can imagine. Um, and then number two for me is this is such a great context to be talking about soft skills, collaboration, leadership, self-awareness through that's come up. It comes up in this conversation. It's come up in so many in this mini series. And I don't know about you, Jeff, but as an educator, I am always looking for new environments where mm. we can practice our soft skills in. And I think the realm of gaming is such a great one because we're also talking about something that's social and fun. And I don't know anyone who doesn't need a little more fun play in their life. Um, what about you? Anything that you're thinking? I can't wait for listeners to hear more about this yeah, I think, you know, for for me, the the thing I keep coming back to, and I know listeners have heard me say this a lot, is this idea around how are we inviting student culture into our classroom? And for better or for worse, the gaming culture is a lot in our students today. Uh, they've grown up with games. And I mean, I quit playing games at, you know, Mario Brothers and Duck Hunt is the last games I remember playing. But these games are just incredible. And I think for me, a big part of it is being able to just think about if this is the culture of our students, if this is the culture of a generation, and it is our job, our obligation as educators, this is what we signed up for, is to support and nurture the next generation. We have to be willing to step into their world and learn a little bit more about it. I'm not saying you need to go out and play every new game. But you have to understand, to your point of where where can I create these connections between their world, their culture, and what I know I need to do. And I think throughout this mini series, we we hear connections through math and science and production and drama and music with music behind the scenes and you know research that's coming out of universities. I think we talked to three university professors, uh, and so even going into university, there are degree programs you go into that you can. Uh, further your skills in the gaming world. There's just so many connections that I think we can make. Uh, and you bring up some great ones, even in today's episode with Dr. Malone around this idea of how do we take some of the things that are done in the gaming world around, you know, pre-reading games and what are they going to say and bring those into our text-based world that we need kids to, you know, we need kids to also engage in. And I think anytime we can make those kinds of connections, we invite 
a student culture into our classroom. And when we invite student culture into our classroom, we get engagement. When we get engagement, we get learning. And that is the ultimate goal for this. Uh, and the other thing I think that is just blowing my mind is, you know, usually we reach out to people in these mini series and Trisha, you will reach out to 10 or 15 people. And our goal is to get four or six. And the problem is you reached out to 10 people and we got 10 people and we're like, oh, this is a big mini series. They're just so freeing of the giving of their time, giving of their knowledge. Um, I think it just goes also goes to speak to the gaming culture of just willing to share, willing to give you the trick to finish the game, or here's the new insight we have through this research we're doing through loot boxes in some games or the way you can go coins and level up or leadership skills. It's just, it's unbelievable to me how people were willing to give so freely of their time, their energy, and their knowledge in supporting everyone here at Shifting Schools that's going to get to listen to this to level us up. Um, you know, and, and our just gaming knowledge as well. So I, I just, to me, that that's been a, it's been a humbling experience from that, that point of view as well. It's absolutely true, Jeff. And, you know, I want to be crystal clear in saying these conversations don't only point, Hey, students, like this is a potential thing to focus on. We also have guests who they're doing esports with students right now in K-12 yeah. education. And in terms of what you said about their generosity with wanting to share yeah. that, you know, they told us it's because of the real power they are seeing in the experience for those students in terms of how much those students love collaborating through esports. Um, so I'm just I'm so excited about this series. It's been a real joy to work on. I've learned so much. Uh, so listeners, we'd love to hear back from you uh, what some of the learning is that you're doing or what the state of esports is like at your school. Or have you done the research to find out which esports scholarships are available in your area? Because that's going to come up um, in this series as well. So today's episode, our special guest is Dr. Krista Lee M. Malone, who happens to be the director of both the UW-Madison Game Lab and the Game Design Certificate. Her past research has included MMORPGs. Those are massively multiplayer online role-playing games. And her research also looks at the making of educational games. So we're going to get into that. She also focuses on game design in the social sciences with a specific emphasis on anthropology and community outreach. So listener, if you're wondering what the connection is between social change and games this still this episode i think is going to be a real treat for you yeah such a great episode i'm excited to get us over episode one of our mini series here all about esports and we're also very excited that we have a sponsor for this mini series a shout out to our sponsor uh, Digon Esports. You're going to be hearing about them. Uh, thank you so much for them to being a sponsor of this. And with that, here is episode one of our esports mini sports uh, esports series. Episode one of our esports series with Dr. Krista Lee Malone, director of the University of Wisconsin Madison Game Lab. Dr. Malone, thank you so much for being here. You have said in a previous interview that listeners were going to link to in the show notes that World of Warcraft was the game that helped you see how your passion for anthropology could merge with video games. We're wondering if you can explain more that connection, anthropology and video games. Uh, I think it's not typical that we think of those two things together, but that's kind of become like really the, the core of the work you do. So can you demystify what that bridge might be for our listeners? Yeah, of course. And thank you for having me. Um, so the so in the immediate moment, it was actually a little bit of a surprise to me as well, because I had I had played games before, but I played a lot of single player games or coach or couch co-op. Right. Like I remember being a very small child playing like Mario Brothers, for example. Um, but anthropology is, is about culture and groups of people. Right. And like a lot of people, uh, at one point I mistakenly thought that gaming was a solo activity, but it's not. Um, and I got introduced to World of Warcraft while I was doing my master's degree. Um, and very fortunately, there was 
Um, at that time, only three anthropologists in the world that do video games, and one of them just happened to be in my hometown. So I make this like what was for me a discovery and I'm like, oh my gosh, MMOs are very social. There's all these people, they have their own culture that is evolving and coming from these experiences. And then I very fortunately just had an expert in my hometown that I could go to and say, hey, I wanna do this, take me on as your students. I'm gonna write about World of Warcraft. Um, and from there, I mean, from there it's history, right? Like I did that work and I published on that work and then continued um, doing video games um, from then on. And so then in terms of like the study and the culture of the world, is it the world of all of the players or is it the world of the video game or is it that combination of both for you that um, is, a, is of most interest? So it's definitely the combination, right? Because the, the conversations and the things that people are doing would not happen without the game world. Mm -hmm. So you can't really isolate those two aspects. If, if World of Warcraft didn't exist, all those millions of people would be doing something else and they would be somewhere else, right? Um, <clears throat> also, you can't separate those two things because World of Warcraft is structured in a certain way like all games are, there is an architecture. There are things you can do and that you cannot do based on the code. The code is really, um, as Dr. Malaby puts it, a governing force within a game. Because um, unlike laws in the real world, where you just have to follow them, you literally can't not follow them, <laughs> right? We're gonna set hacking aside, that's a different right, thing, right? Yeah. But if you're not hacking the game, then, you know, if I don't have a flying mount, I can't fly. Like I just, I just can't. There's no, there's no button that will make that reality, right? Um, but then people interact with those things in different ways, and even without hacking, they sometimes find creative ways to um, interact with the environment and with each other in ways that the designers didn't intend. Mm -hmm. um, and so, there, those two together really not only can they not be separated but that's where all the interesting things happen because that's where you see these emergent practices and these new ideas about um, how people should interact and how culture should work or can work mm, i love that that's so cool um and you're right i never thought about that the code is the rules um and what you can and can't do in a game i really like that that's that's got me thinking already here this morning and one of the things we want to be doing with this this mini series one of our focuses with this mini series is exposing educators and parents to the idea of what are potential future jobs or uh careers out there for people who go through programs like you have as the director of the U of Dub Madison Game Lab, you're in a very unique position to talk about that. Can you maybe give a couple of, of examples of what studies in the game lab looks like and what goals those scholars have for their future after, after spending time in the game lab? Um, yeah, of course. So, um, I mean, the first answer, although probably not helpful, is there are so many jobs that are related to games yeah. um, and it, more than I think a lot of people even realize because it, they are full on businesses, right. right? You need marketing, you need HR, you need the artists, you need the coders, you need design, you need all of those things, right? Um, in the game lab and for our certificate program, we really focus more on design um, and a little bit on development. So we're really looking at kind of the core pieces of making a game itself. Um, but in the lab, that gets expanded a little bit. Um, so the lab is essentially designed to be a maker space mm -hmm. and different people use it in different ways. Um, so occasionally, there's no, we do not hold classes fully in the lab, but sometimes for a specific week, I will bring a class in or one of my colleagues bring in a class so that they can use what's available. Students can come in um, to use the equipment we have there. So we have things like a walk on board for artists um, and desktops, laptops with various programs that would be, um, I mean, mostly too expensive for. Sure one student to have all of that on their own personal PC, right? So they can come in and use these tools. Um, and there's not just digital, we also have a ton, just like one big shelf of 
analog pieces, papers, meeples, dye um, for making analog games and paper wow, prototypes. Cool. And this really gives a space for students and also faculty to experiment with different ideas and to you know bring to life the ideas that they are having. Um, and it's a large enough space to cooperate with people also, right? So I was actually just in there yesterday because um, my office, for example, is great for just me if I am checking email, but the second I want to work with like even one other person, it becomes too small. <laughs> um, so, and right now, just to give you an example of one thing that is happening right now in the lab is I have a group of students um, that I had been working with on a different project, like through classes during the semester, but they got together and decided to put in a proposal for a game jam that is run by Jennifer Ann's group, which is a charity. Mm -hmm. um, and they are using the lab space to work on that and submit their, they, be, they were a finalist, they, it's a group, they're a finalist and so they're submitting that game. Um, Hilariously, I don't know anything more than that because we have had to conscientiously not use the lab at the same time because I am a judge for this charity gym. <laughs> so we have worked out that we, so like normally it's just open and you can just come in whenever right. you want. But with this particular group, we have had to communicate to make sure we are not there at the same time because I cannot know what they're doing. Yeah. Because we'll judge the, the games blind, yeah. of course. Um, and so uh, a couple months from now, I will get to know what they are doing. But right now, all I know is that they are a finalist and they're using the lab and they are doing it on days I'm not there. That's pretty cool. As you know, our focus is on K-12 education and, and our listeners are, are educators across the K-12 spectrum. As you kind of think about you know, where you are and the things that you're doing uh, in the game lab at U of Madison, what are, what are some things you think that educators, maybe even specifically middle school, high school educators need to be thinking about uh, with students today, knowing that there are all of these future jobs and different ways that, uh, you, you know, you can have a future in gaming uh, after, after high school, after college. What are some things you think that that educators really should have in the back of their mind as we are, you know, preparing the next generation? Um, yeah, so I I feel like I have to have a shout out to my mom right here. So I was raised by educators. My mom, her sister, and three of my dad's sisters are all wow. teachers. Um, yeah, so I, I've had these conversations actually, um, and I think that. The, the things, the big talking points that I always put forward are, first of all, don't talk about games like they're a waste of time. Mm. There's, they're not. There's a lot that can be learned in them. There's a lot that can be learned through them. And also, let's be real. If you tell a middle schooler that this thing that they love to do is a waste of time and they shouldn't do it, they're not going to listen to you anyways, right? Sure. That That is a losing <laughs> battle. My mom specifically taught middle school. so. Yeah, But if you go along with it, right, and if you encourage it, but encourage it in healthy ways, there is so much that can be learned, right? So if you have a student who really wants to go into video games, um, I think the obvious answer is encourage them to learn how to code. Um, but then if they don't like coding, or even if for whatever reason, they feel like that's not the, the end all be all, which is also fine, a lot of what makes games work has absolutely nothing to do with code, right? Like I mentioned before, you need the artists, you need the producers, you need the designers, you need a whole lot of people that do not need to know how to code. Yeah. So actually the reason I recommend learning a little bit about coding is if you're good at it, you can do that and then you can be the developer and that's great. If you learn a little bit and you don't like it, at least you'll know enough that you can then talk to the coders. Mm. Um, cause that can be important to know even just a little bit to be able to have technical conversations with the people that you're working with. The other thing that I like to point out, um, and there are, are other people in the space that also talk about this is when you look at things like MMOs specifically, and also esports specifically, you're also learning a lot of social skills. You're learning about teamwork. You're learning about leadership, um, and 
depending on the space you're in, you can be learning good habits or bad habits, right? I'm not going to pretend that all of the spaces are, you know, perfect. Um, but it, there are a lot of very important skills that can be learned there that then go over to any job you want, right? I mean, one of the things I say about some of these soft skills that you can learn during games is like if a freshman comes up to me and asks about this, they'll say like, well, are you planning to be a hermit in the mountains? <laughs> if the answer is no, then you need social skills, right? right? You're going to work with other people. Like there's very few people that can like function and be locked in a room by themselves. I mean, even right now, I'm alone physically, but I'm interacting with two other people, right? Um, and these are our skills that can be learned through games, which let's face it, is a lot more engaging than, you know, sitting down and in, in, in trying to learn it like, I don't know, having someone lecture at you about being, <laughs> about how teams work right like that doesn't that doesn't work very well but you can practice it and you can learn it in a game that then doesn't feel like work it doesn't feel like you're learning because you're enjoying yourself yeah is there is there any research and i'm just asking because maybe i figured you would know if anybody but is there any research out there on this idea around learning to collaborate in in and through games and gaming and those people then becoming leaders of pro, you know project managers or leaders of groups in the you know quote unquote in the rest of your lives or in the real world like is there a is there any kind of correlation between the overlapping of the skills that we see you creating you know when you are leading your world of warcraft being the game you know where you're leading a, a tribe and then you come out and you're you're using those same skill sets in your in your work as well um so yes with the caveat of that um that gets hard to track like most yeah. soft skills are one thing i've noticed in this type of research sure. Um, or even besides the research, when I talk to industry professionals, they they know when soft skills are missing, right? Or when mm -hmm. they're like trying to hire and whatnot, they'll see when soft skills are missing, but a lot of times it's hard to pinpoint exactly which one is missing or, or exactly how to fix it, right? And that's why we call them the sure. soft skills, right? It's not like math, you, you can add two plus two right. or you can't, there's no fuzziness there. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> A lot of the research doesn't, a lot of the research that I know of does not have a very clear cut answer to your question, but it, it lends mm. information to your question. Um, and some of that dates pretty far back. Um, my first publication ever, which was in 2009, was on DKP points in World of Warcraft. <clears throat> and it was published as an economics paper, but Oh, maybe I should say DKP stands for Dragon Kill Points. It's like a microeconomic system within an MMORPG. Um, but my point to that paper, because I'm not an economist, was how this system was used to um, create loyalty and group cohesion. Um, so you talked about how the leadership mm. decided that this was the method they were going to use to keep everyone in line and to keep everyone invested and working together. And the system <clears throat> is basically designed so that, yes, of course, you can have people who are just trying to go what's best for them, but the um, everyone benefits more from these systems thinking about the team as a whole. Um, so that is that is one example. Um, and then there's other work on DKP in different games, and there's other work on um, guilds um, and learning those skills. Um, Mark Chen has a book out that I am, of course, blanking on the title right now. Um, his book, I think, is mm -hmm. maybe 10 years old now also, but he was talking about education and expertise and learning these skills through high-end rating guilds. Um, some of the research is also now being put into practice. Um, and so we're seeing um, indie studios, especially looking to some of these ideas and trying to consciously design it into games. 
Um, whereas earlier, it seems like some of this was happening accidentally. Some of it was like legacy from analog games. But now there's this push toward pro-social games and to educate. There, a lot of people are calling it educational games that are not educational. Right. So we're, mm. you're going to learn these soft skills and they're consciously designed with the idea of making it so the student doesn't necessarily notice. Um, I recently signed up for the alpha of a game called Causeway, which is a esports game, and they are doing this where they're trying to design for that pro-social, like specifically learn leadership, learn teamwork um, through esports. Through esports. Cool. You know, their alpha is not ready yet, so I don't really know how that's going to go. Um, but. That right. is definitely in line with the trend I am seeing right now. Uh, you also, of oh. course, direct the game design certification program. And part of the description, and again, listeners will be sure to link to it in the show notes. Part of the description for that pathway says that understanding game design is also an important opportunity for learners to engage with making positive social change. Can you talk more about that part of the learning journey? Because you know, something else we're really trying to do with this mini series on gaming and esports is, I think, debunk some of the like myths or disinformation that's out there about gaming uh, being, as you said yourself, like some folks will just refer to it as like a waste of time. Um, and and clearly, your game design certification is really, I think, flipping that kind of myth or misinformation on its head. So, can you? explain for folks who are scratching their head and saying, huh, how does that work? Yeah, of course. Thank you for asking. Um, so yes, uh, the, um, so the program was set up um, before I was hired, um, right? So I was not a part of the decision-making processes for that. I came, I basically was hired for the first year it went live. Um, but the idea there is very similar to other art forms actually, right? So if you like take movies, for example, you also have something like documentaries um, or even historical fiction, right? So you could have a movie like um, Schindler's List, which is, was not presented as an educational movie, right? But there's a lot that you can be learned from it. Um, I have no idea why that was the movie that came to my brain right now, but it was. Um, you know, and same thing with TV shows, right? You have things that are entertainment. You have also documentary series, um, you know, books. You have, you know, your dime store science fiction, and you also have you know, textbooks and whatnot. And games are really no different. Um, so yes, you have games mm. that are, you know, commercially made for commercial purposes with the idea of being just for fun. I would argue there's still things to learn from them, but that wasn't their intention, right? Our program focuses on doing this intentionally. So rather than <clears throat> accidentally learning something, because you could argue that you accidentally learn uh, leadership from esports because and I call it an accident only because the companies don't, they're not educational companies, that's not their goal. So we're trying to do this intentionally. So um, a lot of them are focusing on, um, I'll give you some examples of published games. Um, so if you look at the work of say, Nikki Case, you can find his work for free at Itch.io. Um, he has one game called Coming Out Simulator and it's great. And it, I mean, it is what the title says, right? So it kind of takes you through this story of coming out of a, I think he's supposed to be like a teenage boy at the time, like the teenage boy trying to come out to their parents, right? And that experience and, and what that was like. Um, there's another game that I think is brilliant, especially for the age that we live in, that is called We Come What We Behold. And in this game, mm. You, you don't really have a role of one player, um, but you are seeing people being exposed to news stories. And then each of the little people, their perception changes based on how the story was presented, right? So the phrasing of a story, regardless of the facts, will change how we think about it, right? And we know this because if you look at Fox News versus MSNBC, 
even if they're covering the same story, it looks like a different story, right? And so that's what this game is is right. showing. Um, and the game itself, like, it wouldn't matter where you politically lean because the stories in the game are, are silly. It's I think like one of them is like if you wear square hats, you know, people who wear square hats are bad or something like that. Like there are all these silly things, but it shows that process, right? So there's there's a lot of there is a lot that could be talked about assigning that game, which I actually do assign that game to one of my classes. And then we have like a whole week when we're talking about, you know, facts and information um, and critical thinking. Um, and that's what we're talking about. We talk about like serious games when we talk about what um, we are trying to to promote with these pro-social design behaviors. I'm trying to get my students to think about these games and design these types of games. So I'm, I'm, I'm guessing maybe another example of this, I don't know if you're familiar with the game Survival of the Best Fit, which is meant to show the baked in bias uh, of AI with hiring process. So any company that's using AI as, as part of their, their hiring, it kind of simulates and shows you how, um, that machine learning is not neutral. And we often kind of, you know, say like, oh, well, it, it's AI, it's going to be more fair, or more equitable. And this really shows you how um, that's not the case, right? And we really need to understand algorithmic bias. And I, you know, I, what I love about this idea of games for learning or questioning or provocation is, it's one thing if I say to somebody, oh, you know, algorithms are biased that might just go over somebody's head or come across as, I don't know, like my opinion. But games like texts kind of almost slow us down. And I don't know if, if you find this or your students say this, it's almost, I think, um, like I am engaging with something, I am immersed in it, and my defense mechanisms kind of go away to some extent. I don't know if that's a fair assessment or um, if you have any any thoughts on that. Is is this sort of like a great text type for learning simply because we don't expect it? Yes. Um, so, so I really feel like there's two parts here, right? So it's the algorithm question and then also what you're really describing is why games are powerful learning tools. Um, and of course, the flip side of that is why they could also be dangerous. Right, because I, I mentioned these games that have these very pro-social um, messages, but there's nothing to stop somebody with a detrimental message from also making a game. Um, but yeah, uh, we, we engage with games because they're fun and they're interactive. And so we do kind of let our guard down. And the other thing is it's not just about letting your guard down. That's part of it. And the other thing mm -hmm. is that you are interacting, right? So if you, you know, it's, we talk about like if you learn by doing, right, versus listening, like a lecture format is one of the, the weakest ways to learn things because you're just sitting there and passively probably zoning out while the teacher speaks at you. Whereas in a game, you are interacting, you are making decisions, you have to pay attention at a higher level, right? Like if the student falls asleep during class, chances are it's not the end of the world they're doing it every week maybe right but if you fall asleep once during class and you miss something you're probably fine but like in the middle of a game that's not going to happen because you're not you're, you're not going to be able to make the next move if you dozed off and i have dozed off playing games and then i have to literally go back to the last save because i can't function not knowing what i missed right um so so yes you have that immersion you have that um that your guard is down you have that you're not even realizing that you're putting this work forward and all of that contributes to it. The, the algorithm issue also relates because you, you know, the, the game also has algorithms that are responding in a certain way, right? And so this is another thing I also have to cover in my game design classes is sometimes I have students bring in a game and we'll do play tests and it turns out horrible because sure, they had, they will have the best intentions in the world, right? But you never know how a person's gonna use a thing. And sometimes because play testers do unexpected things, all of a sudden this game that they designed to be positive 
starts taking a very dark turn, for example, right? Um, it's all things you have to be careful about. Um, and with algorithms, I think, you know, and, and I would say this is true both in games and outside of games. Um, you know, and now with all the chat GPT stuff coming up also, um, I think that we as a society really need to take the time to understand what an algorithm is and how they are made. Mm. One of the scariest things that I ever heard a person say was I, I had commented to this person about what TikTok was showing me. I was like, yeah, I'm right. Like I, I'm like, I stopped using TikTok for a while because I was not seeing any content I was interested in. The algorithm had obviously pigeonholed me in a certain way that I just didn't care about. And the person said, well, maybe you're wrong. Maybe TikTok was showing you what you needed. Mm -hmm. And that to me sounds religious, mm -hmm. which is why it was scary. I'm like, no, 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 no. This, this, this algorithm doesn't know anything. It doesn't know what I need. It doesn't know me. Like these are calculations in the background, mm -hmm. but this person stuck with it. And then we talked about how TikTok shows her what she needs and like, it, it, she would like change how she perceived what was going on in her life at that moment because of what TikTok was showing her. And I'm like, this is terrifying, mm. actually. Like this, this trend of algorithms kind of taking this like religious understanding on. And she is not the only example of things I have heard. She, what she said was the most blatant, but I've also heard people talk about the way games respond to player input as being natural. Yeah like it's not natural this did not grow on a tree you do not go out to the algorithm tree and pick it <laughs> and then put it in your game basket yeah. right we need to be aware that human beings make decisions they write that code and they make it behave in a certain way because of how they want it to work or because how of the way they see the world but that is not the only way it's not the most natural way in it surely is not looking out for you. So I'm wondering then with your game design work, like what you're talking about is almost like both sociology and psychology. Like when you're talking about understanding human decision making, are there other links like, you know, to game design? You know, we, we just want to make sure that we're, we're helping our K-12 educator audience understand if your student is interested in this field, maybe also help them understand there's a really great bridge into the gaming industry, which, I mean, I, I'm going to repeat this fact because I was not aware of this. And it's incredible to think that, you know, I think of like Hollywood and the film industry as like the biggest of the media industries. And it isn't. It's it's gaming, right? Like that's incredible. So anyway, I'm just wondering, are there any other links that you're thinking K-12 educators should be aware of if your student is showing interest in this field just let them know like actually there's a really clear link with that field and game design um yes i'm not sure if there's actually a question there but like i agree with everything you said <laughs> um, uh yes there are there are links um i think the i mean maybe the the easier thing to do and this is something i i have done um for example i mentioned my mom was a teacher um and i would go to her school they would have um what do they call it like job mm -hmm. days right yeah. um and so i would come in and i would i would talk about like all of the different things that relate to um gaming and you know like you mentioned it's not even if you have an interest in gaming, there are so many ways that can be incorporated, even if you are not in gaming directly. Um, so there are also games being used now in like therapy for kids and adults and for like PTSD with the military. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, if you have a kid who's like, I'm really interested in psychiatry, but I am also really interested in gaming, that would be, you know, one avenue. Um, and yeah, I think actually that statistic of how big the gaming industry is, is an important one because I think that um, for some reason, and I'm not entirely sure why, a lot of people do not think about where their games come from. 
And I get that because when I was in high school or when I very first started undergrad, it never occurred to me to work in games. Mm. It was never an option before me, right? It was everyone's like, you know, you'd be a doctor or a lawyer or something. I don't know. I was good in science. So people are just like, oh, you should be a doctor. But a doctor is a very obvious career choice, right? Because you're there and you see them and, and your day-to-day life. Um, but even then you have surgeons that train in like simulators, which are basically just more serious games, right? So there's a connection if you want to do medical school and game design right there, train surgeons. Mm. Um, so uh, I guess that was a long way of saying, you know, if there's a university near you or even if there's not, like call them up because a lot of professors or go on social media and like hit up the person who is doing community management for a game and ask them to come talk to your class. Mm. Like the number of people who are actually really cool with coming to visit a class and have a conversation is, is pretty high. Um, I know I have had industry professionals come in. They are always happy to come in and talk to my classes. I know from my perspective, when I have gone into high schools and middle schools to talk about what I do, like I enjoy that. I like what I do. So if somebody, you know, calls me up and says, hello, would you like to talk about what you do for an hour? I'd be like, yeah, that sounds great. I well, love that. And I just, well, and, and you know, there's to your point where you said, where do games come from? My number one answer in my head was like the app store. That's where they come from. We don't think about everything <laughs> that goes in the background, right? You just, you download them to your Xbox or you download them to your phone and and that's it. That's where games come from. We don't think about mm-hmm. all of these things that go in the background, um, you know, and, and our, and I'm excited to get this, you know, this esports mini series started and be thinking about all of the ways that there are these connections to we need to be thinking of because it is a huge industry that I don't think we focus on very much inside of K-12. And yet we know that esports in K-12 is becoming a bigger thing here in my home state of Washington. It is now actually an official sport like football, basketball, baseball, esports. Um, and and mm-hmm. that is continuing to be a thing. And there is a reason for that. There's probably a better chance a child's going to be esports in middle school and have a career in esports than be a football player in middle school and have a career in football, right? And so I just think the way that we look at these um, and, and the way that we need to change, I think, as an adult, as a 46-year-old adult, change my mindset around this idea of what games are and what they can be for a generation that that really finds them useful, helpful, and um and in inspiring. And I think that that to me is, is one of the goals of, of doing this mini series as well. So Trisha, how about you? Well, I'm just thinking too, you know, my background as a, a lit teacher, the world of video games has changed so much. And, you know, your example, World of Warcraft, we have these incredibly rich texts that are culturally relevant for students to be talking about, you know, as you were talking mm-hmm. about, like even the play testing, I feel like a read testing, a sampling of some of these games um, is such a great way. I mean, what you were talking about in terms of some of the artistry of these games, what a great way to talk about tone, mood, what a great way to talk about metaphor. So I just, you know, I, I really appreciated you coming on the show to share your background and again, making that bridge between anthropology and gaming, I think there's a lot more connections for us to make. And it's wonderful that, again, folks like you are sharing your work. Like, And, and again, you, you, I know that you're very active on Twitch as well. So your idea about reaching out, asking for somebody to come in as a guest, it's a great reminder. If your class, if you know you've got a bunch of students who are really passionate about video game, what have you done to support that interest, right? Mm. Reach out to folks and and let them tell the story of how they've made their pathway. And um, I mean, I, I don't think that you're going to tell me that I'm wrong on this, Dr. Malone, but like you seem so happy in the work that you do. And I think that's like presenting young folks with the example of folks who find their work to be so rewarding and truly tap into something they're interested in. I think it's really important that we are showing them like a, adulthood could be a great thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yes, you are you are right about about everything and 
you know, the, the only thing I tell like younger students or when I do guests is, are there going to be aspects you don't like? Of course, like the paperwork is still a part of my job yeah. and it's not my favorite part. Right. But, um, that is, that is worth it because there is, there is purpose and meaning for me in the work that I do. And that is what I have read in psychology papers. It will make you happy in your job. So apparently that is the secret sauce. Well, yes. we're, we're glad that you found it and that you've come on the show to share it with our listeners. Dr. Malone, thank you so much. Uh, listeners, links to learn more about this work that's making Dr. Malone so happy will be over there in the show notes. And who knows, maybe you'll hear back from some of our listeners who would love a virtual visit from you. Um, to connect.